welcome our moderator, Mr. Sid Yog, founder and chairman, Virgis Detail, founder, the Xander Group Incorporation, and professor, Harvard Business School, who would lead the discussion today. I also welcome our panelists, Mr. Ajay Bijli, chairman and MD, PBR Limited, Mr. Jay Suresh, MD and CEO, Irvin Fashion Limited, Mr. Prahlad Kakkar, chairman and founder, the Prahlad Kakkar School of Branding and Entrepreneurship and advertising film director for Genesis Film Production, Mr. Jose Gomez, Chief Development Officer and Member of Management Board, Eaton Group, France. Mr. Manish Kashyap, Regional MD and Asia Pacific Global Head Advisory and Transaction Services, Agile CBRE. Mr. Ramesh Iyer, Vice Chairman and MD, Mahindra Finance and Chairman FIDC. And Ms. Charlotte Jonobor, CEO, Devishabham, France. So before we get started, a little housekeeping, though we would love to hear from you all. But please write question in your uh, control panel. Your question would be taken up during the Q&A session. And if you miss anything, do not worry, because the recorded version of the webinar will be shared with you on demand. So not taking much time here, I would request Mr. Yog to take over. Over to you. Hello and uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on which part of the world you're in. Uh, I'm in Singapore, so good afternoon here. But welcome to all the panelists. Ashna has made my job uh, very easy because she's already introduced all of you, so we can dive straight in. Just for the benefit of participants, and I see that we have about 423 and changing every minute already, and I suspect that that will go up. But just for their benefit and for all the panelists' benefit, uh, I'm going to lay out the ground rules or how we are structuring this discussion so that we can be efficient, cover as much as possible, and give the audience uh, a chance to engage with our panelists because I am sure they have a lot of questions for them. Uh, I'm going to kick it off by asking each one of our panelists to spend no more than five minutes uh, talking about uh, their business, their sector, how uh, they are reimagining the future, which is what MAPIC uh, has uh, asked us all to do, uh, across multiple different uh, aspects of their businesses, the environment that they're operating in, the new normal as uh, has become evident across the world. Uh, and we have panelists from across the world. Uh, so uh, we would uh, really like the opportunity to listen in uh, to uh, perspectives, which may be very different in different parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, so I'm gonna spend about five minutes each with each of our panelists. I'll direct uh, the, uh, the flow. And then post that, I have a few questions that I would like to ask, uh, and it would be for, uh, no particular person, but obviously each one of our panelists has areas of expertise, and uh, but the others should feel free to jump in as well. And then I'm going to open it up to the audience uh, to uh, have them ask questions. And I, as Ashna explained, uh, given the format, please write your questions in the chat box and we will pick those up and I will uh, direct those questions to our panelists. So. Uh, Without much ado, let's dive straight in and with no other particular order in mind, but because alphabetically Ajay, you come first. So I'm just going to start with uh, Ajay Bijli, who's uh, the founder and CEO of uh, PVR, a company that is very well known in India. Uh, Ajay, would you spend about five minutes, please, telling us uh, what you're facing, how you're addressing it, and really focus more on how we're coming out of this rather than what's happened, because that I think everybody is uh, quite aware of already. But uh, over to you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Sid, for organizing this. Uh, good morning to all the panelists, some distinguished uh, set of people here. Uh, thanks for having me here. So I'll, I've started my stopwatch, uh, Sid. So it's already <laughs> five minutes. Basically, as uh, Sid has... Uh, already done a generous introduction. I, I've been running uh, uh, cinemas for the last 30 years. I opened my first cinema in 1990. And uh, now we have about 850 odd screens in India in various uh, cities and states. And uh, India is a very disparate market. Everyone behaves differently. But this particular pandemic, which everybody is facing for the first time in their lifetimes, has shaken everybody. Uh, so our industry was the first one to get hit very badly. And uh, we shut down even before the official lockdown on March 11th. 
and then um, even now we don't know there is no visibility much of when we'll be opening although partially the lockdown is opening in various places um, I have a feeling that uh, or whatever little information that we're getting from the real estate developers because most of our properties are in malls and shopping centers um, and uh, uh, is that around 15 June uh, to uh, maybe end June is when the malls will open. Manish is here. Of course, Sid uh, is also operating some brilliant malls. We are also in his malls. And I think around the first week of July to 15th of July is my suspicion that cinemas will start opening. Uh, we have two or three uh, engines uh, that have really made uh, the cinema going very, very popular in India. Just to give you little statistics, uh, India sells about 1.45 billion tickets uh, a year very small ticket price as compared to US and China. So these are the two markets that you get compared to. China sells about 1.3, US sells about 1.2, and our size is about 1.6 billion in terms of net box office revenues. China 9.3 and uh, US is about 11.5. So, but Indian movie going culture is very, very strong. 1500 films go through the system. South India has got its own languages, uh, North, West, everywhere. So uh, some films are meant for the whole country. Uh, so those films, for those, everything has to open in one go. About 9,000 screens India has got, out of which about 3,000 are new build multiplexes, 6,000 are old single screens, two tier cinemas. But my suspicion is that uh, the uh, South Indian market, which is only meant Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, these are the South Indian markets where the movie going propensity is very, very high. These will open up first. Uh, Sid, probably you know already Kerala uh, has already opened one mall, Lulu Mall, but the cinemas haven't opened as yet. Uh, but most of the developers are really supporting us and they're saying that the footfall generators, the admissions, the people, the irrigation that happens, happens from large formats like cinemas, food courts and stuff. That in phase one, you can open retail, but phase two, along with the cinemas, also, along with restaurants and food courts also, please open cinemas. So we're very encouraged by the uh, support that we're getting from the retail industry as well. So that's one part which is very important for us to start opening. Uh, the second part is really the uh, films. As I said, 1500 films uh, get through the system imported, which is the US, Hollywood, British films and the Indian films that are made. Uh, all the surveys, consumer surveys, which we have done in India and internationally are only showing one thing, that people are watching obviously a lot of movies on OTT platforms. There's now new movies, old movies, long form storytelling, which is your TV shows and short form films. But they still want to see brand new big movies on the big screen, which is their favorite pastime in India at least. So they are saying that as long as there is some safety, security, social distancing measures, which is the zeitgeist of, of the day anyway, uh, that is done. We are fine. But at the, at the same time, we want brand new movies. So our pitch to the producers, film fraternity, where I'm spending a lot of time these days talking to producers, directors, is that please hang on for a little while and wait for the uh, big uh, the cinemas to open to release the big movies. So where we are currently is that uh, we need the malls to open and of course the cinemas to open along them and we not need brand new films to come. The third engine, which I really believe in a lot in India and I'm massively optimistic about that is the consumers. I think people are very, very resilient in India. In any case, our target audience is uh, uh, 12 to 34, 1, 2, 3, 4, we call it. And these guys, in any case, if studies are to be believed, epidemiologists and virologists and medical fraternities to be believed, these are less vulnerable to uh, the virus. These guys are just sick of getting incarcerated at home. They want to get out. They want to get out. They want to go and eat. They want to meet their friends and they want to watch movies. Uh, so they are uh, really the main engine uh, which makes me very optimistic. It's going to be a slow burn. It's not going to happen over, overnight. Uh, 15th August is one important day as well because it's Independence Day. Plus a lot of movies are lined up. Uh, Hollywood movies like Wonder Woman, uh, 1984, and the new movie, uh, Indian film called Surya Vanshi, which is a big blockbuster. I think the, a lot of things, uh, uh, uptake will happen from uh, August 15th onwards. Before that, of course, we'll have to do a lot of measures to make people safe. I was just write, writing an article where they said, how are you going to give confidence to consumers? I said, consumers have given confidence to me all this while. That's why the circuit is open. If I can give confidence to them with open arms, I'll do that. I'll make sure every single possible benchmarking in the hospitality industry, civil aviation industry, hotels, everywhere, all cinemas, global benchmarks are there. We'll make sure that they're safe. Uh, just briefly, I don't know how many minutes I've already taken, 
uh, but uh, digitization, less touch points at the box office, at the food and beverage uh, counters, uh, staggered seating, which is groups can sit together, but, actually, but then you leave an adjacent seat together. It's very obvious family of three, four, they're all living together just now. When they'll go out and watch movies, they don't want to be uh, sitting apart. So uh, all over the world, staggered seating means groups, couples, families sit together, but then you leave one or two seats, uh, adjacent seats empty, which reduces our installed capacity by about 25% only. That's what we're doing. Disinfectants, clean, cleanliness, masks, PPE kits, that goes without saying. Uh, sensors for your taps and faucets. So everything that is possible uh, that is being done, benchmark all across the world, across industries, including cinemas, will be doing to make sure uh, that people feel comfortable when they come. And as I said, once again, I'm repeating why I feel confident is because the youngsters are saying we want to come out. Uh, partial lockdown has... Okay, I'm going to cut you off there. Thank you for that introduction. Apologies. But no, no, there's no. a lot of material there which I want to come back to, including omni-channel with the OTTs and how you're going to be uh, designing new strategies around that. I think we'd love to hear that. So we'll come back to uh, Ajay, but I'd like to move on to our next panelist, uh, who I think is in France, uh, Charlotte Jonabaud. And uh, Charlotte is actually on the other extreme of this uh, sort of uh, reaction probably to this pandemic because the company she runs is focused on artificial intelligence and making artificial intelligence, uh, weaving that into making uh, physical stores uh, more optimized to deliver a, a, a better experience for customers online. But let me uh, turn to Charlotte and Charlotte, if you can talk a little bit about what you are seeing in your company, how you are helping uh, other uh, players in the industry and where you see the opportunities in the industry going. Over to you. Yeah, of course. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, we, we developed a software uh, in which uh, there is a artificial intelligence, but this software uh, is the only enable to reconcile the, the online and the physical world by creating local marketplace based on stocks inventories, which means that uh, for a mall, for, ex uh, for example, we will create a new shop based on uh, uh, physical uh, uh, stocks and products, and uh, people will be able to, uh, to see uh, online what is in store in real time or to buy online if they do not want to go in store because uh, they do not have time, they're afraid of, uh, of, um, of the COVID, uh, uh, it is raining outside, and so on. Uh, the, the, so uh, this, uh, this is working very well uh, and uh, today uh, it's even most because uh, all the retail industry players realize that in fact it is very important to, um, to incorporate uh, the online part to the physical retail. But you know, uh, if we just have a look on, uh, on figures, um, uh, there are years, like five years ago, we, will, uh, we see very um, uh, impressive trends where in Europe, uh, footfall decreased by around 60% and online revenue increased by around 170%. So uh, my uh, point of view is just to say that uh, this crisis, uh, it's, uh, it's also a way to, um, to make uh, all the retail players a word that today is very important to uh, to use uh, online to increase the 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 customer experience. So uh, we, if if we look also to uh, to uh, to figures, uh, you will see that in fact uh, seventy percent of people is looking online uh, before going to store, and the the idea of uh, reconciling uh, online and physical store. Uh, generate direct revenue for, uh, for malls, for uh, cities, uh, because we deployed it on malls and cities, but also it increased, uh, it really increased the traffic. So if I give you some figures, for instance, uh, on the village, which is um, a mall where we deployed their solution like two years ago, uh, after one year, the install revenue of, the, of stores increased by uh, an average of uh, 12%, which is great. Uh, and the traffic of the shopping center increased by 30%. Uh, 
because in fact we reconcile the stock but also the data so um, owners uh, know well their customers and make them uh, come to stores uh, more frequently uh, and if we take the example of this crisis in particular uh, the this shopping center was the only uh, uh, shopping center in France close to the public that keeps generating revenue for, the, uh, for, their, uh, for their stores because uh, the e-shop was still running. So for instance, uh, uh, one brand called Lancel, uh, uh, which is a famous uh, French brand, um, uh, in, uh, in, uh, fin, they are selling bags and so on. Uh, they, uh, they generate uh, during the, their store closure uh, more than 150,000 uh, revenue in one month, but the, the store was closed. So it was quite great for them because uh, uh, there were no, uh, no rent, uh, no, no personals, but the store keeps generating revenue uh, because today, in fact, uh, our customers are not only in-store or uh, uh, online, they are doing both and uh, behaviors are evolving. And I see this, uh, this crisis as an opportunity for all the retail industry to, to reinvent themselves and, and to understand what the, the end customers need. Charlotte, thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll come back to you later. There might be a lot of retailers and a lot of shopping center owners in India who might require your services, but uh, uh, but uh, let me come back to that. Let me move across to somebody who actually operates a lot of these stores, a lot of different brands in India, international brands that are, that are present in India, and obviously uh, other brands as well, a whole portfolio. Uh, Jay Suresh, who's, uh, who's, uh, who's, uh, who's, uh, who's the managing director and CEO of Arvind Fashions. Uh, Arvind, uh, Arvind Fashions obviously is a, is, has a huge portfolio of retail brands. I'd like to let uh, Suresh talk to that, but Trish, how are you dealing with uh, the situation as it unfolds in India? What are you seeing? How are your companies or brands reacting? What are you seeing on a, from a customer perspective? Over to you. You're on mute, Suresh. So if you can unmute yourself, please. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, thanks, uh, Sid. I think um, uh, it's my you know, pleasure to be with uh, this panel and then you know, talking to all of you. Uh, before I start, I think I should share the good news uh, because I think as of uh, yesterday, uh, we have opened close to 150 stores, which is roughly, you know, 15, uh, I would say 10% of our total uh, portfolio of uh, stores. Of course, all our high street stores and we had, uh, malls are still not uh, open. And we started actually opening stores uh, three weeks back, uh, started with around 50 stores in week one and uh, moving on to 150 stores as of yesterday. Uh, uh, frankly, you know, we were a bit uh, pleasantly, you know, surprised with the response uh, we had because we thought maybe to do with some pent up uh, demand, we were expecting probably, you know, 10 to 20% of our normal rate of sales, but we are generally, you know, clocking uh, between 70 to 80% of our uh, normal rate of sales uh, in all these uh, stores, which I think is a good news. And we've opened up e-commerce, uh, of course, two weeks back and uh, into the red zones uh, yesterday. Uh, both our own e-commerce as well as uh, e-commerce platforms like Amazon and uh, Flipkart, Mintra are shown very good uh, traction. In fact, I was talking to the CEO of Mintra. He was mentioning to me that yes, their yesterday's sales was uh, business as usual. So that I think uh, I would like to just start sharing some uh, good news uh, in this you know, period of uh, gloom and crisis. Uh, the way we actually are looking at it is uh, like what Ajay was mentioning. We also got affected uh, right from, I would say, 14 when the first set of malls started closing in uh, Maharashtra and uh, Karnataka. Uh, we are looking at consumer behavior into three buckets. I would like to focus on, you know, uh, because I think it's important we understand that how consumer is going to behave if we are to uh, sort of you know, repurpose our uh, entire business model uh, to su suit the consumer uh, behavior. Uh, we put that into three buckets. I would say the bucket number one is all about compulsion uh, because there is going to be a change in behavior because of compulsion. It could be like wearing a mask, uh, you are working from home, uh, you are going to have the social distancing continuing for some more time. Uh, so there is a certain set of habits which are going to be driven by 
compulsion and there is a certain um, set of habits which is a, i would say a realization uh, for example uh, uh, people may realize that you know uh, they don't have to go so much outdoors uh, they can do a lot and achieve a lot sitting at home uh, so that actually could change the way people are going to consume uh, things i am just giving one example there are multiple such uh, uh, examples on you know how people will you know realize that you know many things they were doing on many things they were spending uh, money probably they were not there is no need for them to spend uh, uh, money and the third thing i would say is slightly going to be uh, long term uh, which is going to be a cultural uh, change because if you really look at india as a society uh, i mean if you uh, look at in uh, 80s and 90s probably when i had started my uh, career at hindustan lever Uh, it was more about uh, self denial you know we, our culture is built on uh, self denial which with millennials and uh, gen z move towards you know self indulgence i think that is going to now change uh, for sure that uh, because for the first time probably the millennials and uh, uh, gen z a little bit you know got a jolt uh, so their their spending habits is going to change because we always said that uh, uh, the Gen Z is not going to save that much. They are going to spend more money. They are going to consume more money. So all our uh, strategies were actually geared towards uh, spending of Gen Z and uh, millennials. So that is going to change. Uh, that because this is this is a going to be a permanent change. This is go- so we need to really gear ourselves. We need to understand which are the kind of products uh, which they are going to uh, seek in the future. They are going to change and become much more responsible because now I think that. uh environmental uh, consciousness is really building up given the current uh, situation so i would say that these are the three buckets uh, where we need to really gear ourselves uh, to the changing uh, consumer uh, needs and that's how we really looked at it looking from the first one i believe that uh, it could last for 6 months it could last for 1 year it would it will definitely it will definitely last till probably you know a good vaccine is uh, invented and you know it's uh, sort of administered uh, widely but there are some opportunities which are coming up one i think a very simple opportunity is mask i think we have been able to pretty, pretty quickly put together a package and uh, launch a value added uh, mask in uh, three of our brands across price points and i think they are doing exceedingly well i think they are generating uh, no certain amount of uh, uh, revenues so these are and we have to really now take care of the safety and the hygiene of the customers so we have put together a very good uh, package taking into account the hygiene and the uh, hygiene and the safety of the customers uh, in terms of you know um, all the protocols which we have to follow at the store as we open the uh, store uh, then of Of course, uh, Suresh. If I can, see. in the interest of time, if I can pause you there, and we'll yeah. come back to you as uh, to address some of the issues that you're raising here, which I think are interesting. But if I can move uh, to uh, to Jose Gomez, who is uh, who is uh, the chief development officer and member of the managing board at Eaton Group, which is basically owns a portfolio of brands, billion dollars plus in revenues in 2018, if I uh, remember correctly, who's seen consumers. Uh, in a different manner, perhaps, or at least in a different geography or different geographies, the brands actually operate in over fifty countries. Jose, what are you seeing across those different markets, different brands? Uh, what, 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 what is the company grappling with? You're on mute, Jose. So unmute yourself, please. Speak first. Unmute yourself, please. That's. All right. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having me. You hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, Etam is uh, it's a French uh, retailer. It's uh, over a hundred year old uh, company. We have um, five brands, uh, primarily in the lingerie sector. We are the the leader in uh, lingerie in in France and and among. Uh, the first three biggest players of lingerie in uh, in Europe we have over 1500 stores in uh, 54 uh, countries and with over a billion euros in uh, in in revenue and uh, yes it's been a very very interesting uh, interesting time since since march we spend uh, the first uh, the third week of march uh, closing our 1500 stores 
And now, fortunately, since the 11th reopening, we have started reopening uh, our network little by little throughout the world in, uh, in, this, new, in this new normal. And they're uh, very constrained uh, or uh, different, different or new normal uh, conditions um, than, uh, than before. So a store today does not resemble the stores that, uh, that we used to have uh, in, in early March. At least in the in the field and you know the safety measures that we had uh, we had uh, installed in uh, every store that we open, how the traffic needs to flow, all the safety measures that our employees need to wear, that were uh, um, uh, that our customers expect and our customers wear. Um, we are in a business which is uh, where retail is a contact business. It's a business of the opposite of social distancing. Your is a is a close distance. Uh, business. You're close to the person, especially on lingerie. It's also a contact uh, business. You know, uh, our sales associates measure our customers with tapes around their waist and around their around their chest. So something that we need to adjust that now today is not possible. So we had to set up an enormous amount of uh, you know different measures and different a different selling ceremony, you know, on how to how to deal you know with um, uh, changing rooms uh, with people be willing to use them or not and uh, have safety measures in there, uh, cleaning and disinfecting every time somebody uses one, have self-tape measuring uh, for, um, for our customers so they can tell us where their size is if they don't, if they don't know it. The gel, the mask, you know, the, the general things that the whole retail industry uh, is, is doing today. But Going from this period of uh, complete uh, closure and inactivity on the physical store, the other side of that is that our <clears throat> uh, our online business increased well over a hundred percent. We've we've been an uh, omni-channel company for a very long time, but on the online space since 1995. So many many years ago, over 20 years ago, that we started uh, um, online business. And that has been really has been really paying off. Uh, through the through the month of uh, March, um, our sales online went down, and the stores were also closed because of the first week or two weeks of the confinement, people were too busy thinking of other things. People were hurting food, thinking for essentials, looking for essentials, and nothing, and and they didn't have other things in mind. From uh, the last week in March and on all the way until right now. Our online sales have more than doubled, um, based on an animation that uh, you know not only our intention was not only just to sell products, but it was to engage with our with our customers, not to lose that connection that we have built for so many years uh, with them over a period of closure. So we did an enormous amount of activities online, uh, from yoga to cooking courses to um, um, Projecting our new our new project, and in terms of uh, of omni-channel, the things that now that we have reopened, we have made significant uh, changes to how our stores operate. Before click and collect, you had to enter to the store and go collect it. Now, if you desire, click and collect can be delivered curbside. You just tell you you come in, and somebody will take it outside of the store if you don't want to come in. Um, so we have. Uh, Another very um, new um, new uh, product on our online uh, online offline uh, offering, which is the try at home. You can come to our stores and uh, don't need to try or touch anything. You choose up to ten or eleven products. You take them home. You don't pay for them. You try them at home, and then you send us back what you don't want, and you're only charged what you are what you're keeping. Jose, I'm going to come back to you to keep us honest and on the clock, but mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about how trials will work in the new normal and how yes. disinfectants would have to, you know, clothes would have to go through a disinfectant cycle, etc. It's of a fascinating course. subject in itself, but I want to move on to our next panelist's introdu introduction, Manish Kashyap, who uh, uh, runs all kinds of transactions for CBRE, which is the world's largest real estate services company. And Manish, you're in a very particular, interesting, difficult, but 
unique position because you represent both occupants and occupiers. So you are seeing both sides of that equation. And from where you sit personally, you see it across Asia Pacific and across the world, including in the US. So tell us what you as a business first, rather than the industry that we are going to talk about, which is retail, but you as a business, CBRE, what is your business seen in these times? I mean, how are transactions being done? All the other services that you guys provide? I mean, you're literally the biggest real estate service provider across those functions. How is your business transformed or changing or adapting to this, uh, this situation as it unfolds? Uh, sure, Sid, thanks. Um, so I'll, I'll try and answer you know, the, the way you posed the question. I'll try and answer it uh, uh, with an attempt to try and make it more relevant for retail uh, because there's a lot going on in our sectors in office, in data centers, logistics, warehousing, industrial, etc. Uh, so I, I can touch upon those as well, but perhaps you know, for, for later in the panel. Well, maybe on retail and industrial and warehousing since they're close, so closely connected. Maybe we just focus yeah. on that, please. Sure. So uh, st starting with, I think, retail, uh, you know, I, I want to share the optimism, uh, you know, that uh, Ajay spoke about uh, in terms of uh, what he expects the consumers to do when they come back. Uh, and also Suresh's optimism around, you know, things, things are looking better with 150 stores open. So I think if I had to bring some stories from, uh, from the rest of the region, it's fair to say that in China, uh, you know, there's a lot of positive stories around how malls have reopened and have been able to get customers back uh, in, in you know, large proportion. Uh, so, you know, just in terms of the optimism around that, and again, we can touch upon that later. In terms of how it's transforming our business uh, and how CBRE is sort of working through all of this, uh, that's an interesting question, Sid. And I think uh, in, in some ways, uh, our industrial and our warehousing business, uh, you know, sorry, I'll call it the logistics business, uh, has never been busier. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we are going through a phase where uh, in many markets, uh, we are unable to sort of serve the customer well enough uh, demand is through the roof. But what's interesting is uh, it's not only transactional demand, and this is very important. Uh, the demand for advisory and consulting services around uh, you know, setting up and sustaining supply chains for the future is perhaps even more uh, than what's happening on a transaction side. So you know, we have a specialized business that sort of focuses on you know, how can, uh, how can comp companies optimize their supply chains. Uh, and on that front, uh, we've never been busier. So that, that's really what's going on, in, on on that side. On the retail side, uh, the, the data analytics and the retail analytics part of our business, you know, consumer behavior, uh, the commute, uh, you know, we have, an op we have a tool called Commute Optimizer that sort of enables people to think through uh, what's going on uh, with company, uh, sorry, tracking uh, customers that come to malls or, or any retail locations. So those sort of things are, again, you know, through the roof in terms of demand, because uh, one thing that uh, I think we all, think, when we think of technology and what's happening with retail, we all think of it as having perhaps disrupted it in certain ways. But in, in another way, uh, you know, data is also enabling, you know, much better decision-making. Uh, and therefore the need for better data is really something that we are facilitating through uh, for our clients. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the other things that we are seeing, uh, clearly, uh, you know, there are uh, more, uh, checks and balances being put uh, into all our shopping centers in terms of how uh, they let people in and the, you know, the temperature screening and, uh, and all those other things that Ajay also spoke about in terms of having uh, better facilities uh, for, for the safety of the customers. Uh, it's also fair to say that in most malls that we've seen in China till now, I believe it's climbing every week, uh, but uh, they, they were originally uh, letting in only about 50 to 60% of uh, the capacity for these malls. I believe that's now climbed to about 70, 75%. Uh, and as we think about reopening, you know, the retail um, space in India, uh, I, I think there's a lot to learn from China uh, in how they've gradually reopened. And I think one of the key uh, learnings for us has been interactions with the local government. Uh, and I think that's very true for India as well, uh, that it's a local subject and every single market is very, very unique in the way they're allowing uh, you know, the malls to be open. So with, with that said, I'll hand it over to you because I, I, you know, I know we are running a little bit behind time. I'm happy to take questions as well. Thanks, Manish. And I'm going to come back to you and talk about responses in different countries. But Prehlad, if I can move to you, 
uh, you sit in a very unique position from, apart from being a marketing and ad guru, you also run a school of entrepreneurship. What are you seeing for your business? We'll talk about sector but, uh, later, but your own business, uh, what is the nature of demand of customers right now? What are the strategies that people are coming and asking you to advise on, develop for them? Uh, how is the school reacting? Could you tell us a little more, please, Prela? Well, you know, all classes have gone, um, uh, what do you call, uh, on the computer. And so nobody is attending school because they're all on lockdown. So we are holding a lot of our classes um, uh, online. And um, uh, we we managed to retain a lot of them, but there are a lot of exercises that they have to retain. Our School of Entrepreneurship has got a slightly different model. Uh, only 40% of what we teach is in the classroom. The rest of it is actually real. And we don't have a so-called faculty, which is a permanent faculty. We have people from uh, the business who come and, and take a certain number of lectures and give exercises to the kids. So they're learning from people who are actually hands-on with the industry and not people who have retired from the industry and therefore are not totally in touch with what's going on. So there are two aspects to that. One is to be able to keep that momentum going with, with the, people, the mentors and the mentees. And how do we get them to actually interact with each other? Because that is the whole tactileness of, of, of a classroom is very different from being uh, online. You know, the, uh, the, uh, the whole model of presentation becomes different. So, and all the exercises that we make them do, because a lot of outdoor exercises, we, we insist on, we, we, our basis is that if you have to be an entrepreneur, you have to be relatively, you have to confront fears. So the most obvious fears are fears of uh, animals, fear of horse riding, fear of water, fear of flying, fear of snakes, and so forth and so on. So we, we actually make them uh, familiar with these, uh, their own fears and to deal with them. So it's not that you lose your fear. You don't become fearless because that is being stupid. Because fear gives you safety. But you don't get paralyzed by the fear. So if we put them through that, that whole facing their fear a bit in the three years that we have them with us, then they become entrepreneurs by nature because the business of business is risk. And if you're scared of taking risks, then you'll never be an entrepreneur. So to get them to accept risk as a part of their DNA, uh, you have to teach them out of the class. It, it's, it's a very different model. And we are going to face a lot of problems because of the lockdown with that kind of teaching. So right now we've reverted back to the class, but slowly we hope that we can get them back onto uh, onto the outdoor activities and on whatever else that they're doing. Prahlad, in terms of clients who come to you for marketing, brand strategies, has that? What are they asking you? What What are they telling you? What are they needing from you at this point? Well, right now, uh, nobody knows actually how long the lockdown is going to be in effect. And even after the lockdown, how many people are allowed on a set to actually execute the normal advertising, what you call procedures that we have. So we have to unlearn everything and relearn it. Now, for instance, right now, uh, they're telling us to shoot in different parts of the country in people's homes and allow the people to shoot themselves. But the scripts are done by the agency and by us. And we cast the films depending on which families look like what and whether they're the right target audience. And they actually act out uh, what you call the, 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 the commercial themselves and send it to us by shooting it themselves. And we actually put it together on a table. And it's quite interesting because the engagement is, is like playing a game. And when people look at it and say, hey, these guys are not actors, they're not models, they're real people. And, and, and uh, there, there, there's a whole new, uh, what do you call, model around that. And real people, if written well, if the scripts are written well, they don't have to be shot very professionally because you can do it on a phone. But when people realize that these are real people and your your real shooting is a bit shaky and it's a bit documentary in, in its style instead of slick, then I think the believability of that, that message is far higher initially at least until we get flooded with it. So uh, also when we get into a studio, we're not going to be allowed more than 25 people on the set. 
at any given time with all the safety procedures and all the sanitation and the you know the, the masks and the whole work. So we are going to have to work really lean, and I think the whole film industry is going to really look at how they produce themselves because a 200-man unit will now be reduced to 25, and that's going to be lead skilling. Thank you, Prahlad. I think you touched upon three things, risk-taking, unlearning, and innovation. And I think that we will come back to some of those things because I want to talk about that. But before I do that, I want uh, to move to Ramesh Ayer, who is from Mahindra. He's, the, he's, uh, he's in the financial services uh, industry. He's vice chairman and MD of Mah Mahindra Finance and also chairman of the Finance Industry Development Council. But uh, he's the dollar and cents man. So Ramesh, what are you seeing in your business? Uh, how are customers behaving? What do you foresee changing? Uh, has anything changed for good? Is it going to go back to a new normal or is it going to be back as, as this unfolds? Uh, over to you. What are you seeing in the financing world? Hi, everyone. Uh, you know, it's too early to predict uh, what will happen. Uh, but yes. In the two months that we've gone through, one thing that we've realized is uh, customers of future is going to be very different from customers of the past. Uh, you know, they're simply saying, should we even acquire asset? Why do we have to borrow now? So that kind of a sentiment is weak. There is a lack of confidence in the consumer and uh, a banker or a lender has to rearrange or realign themselves to this new normal. Uh, we were all used to giving money to people who we think have the capability to repay. And I think in this round, what is typically going to happen is, uh, you know, we don't even know how many of them will be able to repay. The businesses are going to shrink, the earning potentials are going to come down, and no one has a clue on how to forecast that requirement. Then we have another problem, which is you have a current lot of consumers who have already taken loan based on their past earnings. And that's going to shrink. So you need to handle them very differently from their ability to repay is going to change substantially. So you have an opening balance sheet, which you need to manage very differently. And then you built a new balance sheet on the new parameter. So if we are all used to credit scoring and things like that, all those parameters will undergo change because those parameters are based on their past earnings and things like that. Now we will have to get into more of social scoring because their new earnings will start to happen at some time later, much later. So you'll have to go into a social scoring of what are their commitments, how they are actually aligned themselves to, how they will allocate their availability of capital and therefore how would they pay. It will also be that we will have to provide them a lot of support temporarily to even come out of this situation. So maybe we'll have to give them more loans when we don't even have a view on how are they going to repay their past loan. And then you have the regulators and the government coming out with various programs, which not necessarily be well aligned to what's happening in the marketplace because credit can change the culture of a consumer. You know, if you give too much of concessions like the moratorium that we talked of, can change the culture of a consumer to repay. So therefore, those kind of cautions need to be also looked into. And, uh, you know, the physical model will slowly start to vanish. I work a lot of uh, activity in rural India which is a very physical model, right? 80, 90% of the consumers pay their monthly installments in cash. Now, if they don't move to a digital platform and you can't go and collect, where is the solution? So I think uh, summarily, I think re-understanding the consumer and erasing what you know about them in the past is going to be the biggest challenge, which means change of mindset in the leader's mind is, is the starting point. The past experience, I'm not too sure, is going to be of any relevance going into this future. So everyone will have to rebuild their knowledge. Everyone will have to re-understand the consumer more deeper. And I think we will all have to get into a new partnership approach and then somewhere make it a win-win. Because in this round, the competitors will have to come together and find solution. Because all of us are going to struggle with the same problem. So I think these kind of new arrangements, if you may call, will emerge. And that would need a very different level of maturity and a very different relevant, uh, relevance of people and people capability. So I'll stop there. Uh, Thanks, Ramesh. Thank, thank you. I think those are very, very interesting uh, observations and I think require a deep study, as you said. 
Uh, and I, I, I think it informs the rest of the discussion as well, because it really talks about the consumer. And I wanted to open with the first question, which is to the panel. And obviously, uh, feel free to jump in, but I'll direct it to Ajay first and Prelat, since they observe human behavior a little more. We were, till February, in the experience economy, as it was called, right? It was all about experience. It was about touch and feel. It was about how do you differentiate yourself. Uh, retail, the retail industry was coping with the onslaught of online already by transforming itself, saying this is the experience economy. And it's not just retail. I think economies everywhere. People were investing in experiences. That seems to, unfortunately, because of an external factor, be put on hold, at least for the time being. Human beings are social animals. Hopefully this will go back. I mean, people were watching theater 5,000 years ago as well, and they've gone through pandemics and wars and things like that. But it may take time and it might evolve into a different sort of way of consuming. What do you, Ajay, and then others, please feel free to jump in. What do you feel from a consumer perspective? And this ties back to you were talking about OTTs and experience. Would the consumer's consumption pattern change? It is changed already, but is it permanently changed or is this also just a short term blip? And yes, it will accelerate what was happening in terms of more online consumption, not just of physical goods, but also of entertainment where you sit and you see this quite closely or and you are not the first time this is not the first time that multiplexes in particular have been written off i mean you changed the entire culture in the 90s where people went back to theater as i said human beings have been watching theater in different formats for 5000 years but what do you see from the perspective of the consumer consumption pattern and why don't you start then we'll open up uh, to the rest as well do you see this as a short term blip or do you see something fundamentally changed here? Uh, see, as I said earlier, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know whether being stick, sticking to one business is a good thing or a bad thing. So I'm pretty myopic in my uh, thinking and understanding about my own consumer a lot. I think uh, out of home entertainment and home entertainment has been around for a very long time. Currently, everybody's talking about OTT, PVOD, which is a premium, uh, you know, uh, VOD and streaming VOD subscription-based model. Uh, uh, but there was TV, there was VHS, there was DVDs, a lot of things were happening. TV was the biggest threat ever to out of home entertainment. Uh, so yet both coexisters. Uh, if you look at Netflix has been around in the US for the last 10 years and the box office collections and the admissions in US have only increased. Having said that, this is absolutely unprecedented. It's extraordinary. I mean, no, nobody has ever experienced anything like this. So nobody uh, can say, okay, what is going to happen? Uh, there is going to be trepidation. There's going to be circumspection. All of a sudden, people are not going to be jumping back and, you know, into the seats and start watching movies. Uh, but I think that um, there are two scenarios. One scenario, there'll never be a vaccine or cure, okay, for this thing, which I don't think is possible because I do believe in the medical fraternity, humanity a lot. And that's going to happen whenever it's going to happen. The other scenario is, uh, phases when uh, it does come and then what happens. So I think uh, we, uh, I don't want to be knee jerk in my reaction and saying that suddenly people will stop going out because it's the fabric of, uh, it's too intrinsic to us to go out uh, and, 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 you know, entertain ourselves and not just be inca incarcerated at home. No matter what happens, one onslaught of technology and digital stuff happens uh, in our homes. Uh, so I think the short term when the vaccine is not there, vaccination is not there, it's going to be a slow burn. People will come out and different segments are there. I like what uh, Prahlad said, uh, Mr. Kakar said just now, that uh, fear, a little bit of fear is important. Uh, otherwise, you become reckless. So there'll be some people uh, who are, as I said, the youngsters who are fearless. They want to come out. All our studies are online. 20 million online members that we've got, they're saying, when are you opening? When are you getting brand new movies? So I'm a little circumspect about them as well because I don't want them to also suddenly start coming. On the other hand, you have the elderly above 55, 60 who are saying they're going to be, uh, you know, they want to be careful. They really want to know what the social distancing norms and the protocols, employee protocols are. So I think uh, in the final analysis, I think people will bounce back. They'll come out and out of home entertainment, whether it's theme parks, cinemas, 
uh, sporting activities, live concerts, they'll all come back, but they'll take time once you know, vaccine gets sorted out, people get used to the new way of life. I don't think out of home entertainment, going out, socializing, social engagement is going to go away. It may get recalibrated, but it won't go away is my feeling. Yeah. And, and just to add to that, I think yeah. if you see Amazon, which is supposedly the big winner out of this, making a play to buy AMC theaters, I mean, maybe there is something to be said for Ajay collaborating with Mr. Ambani to kind of <laughs> launch something which, which is omni-channel, who knows, right? Uh, oh, others, would you like to chime in? Has yes, the of course. economy paused or changed? I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, socially, uh, socializing is not going away. Uh, in France, where we already open, and several other you know, states in the European Union, Spain has opened too, Belgium, etc. But particularly in France, we see an enormous amount of people on the street. Now that the restrictions have been lifted, I mean, there's still no restaurants, there is still, uh, there is still no gyms, but people are out and people are buying. And uh, we are gladly surprised that our sales are significantly higher than what we thought they would be. Um, uh, people are desperate, they've been locked down, so they're desperate to go out. There is uh, an age divide, and, and I agree. You know, older people uh, tend to be more cautious, tend to be more inside, and that's the recommendations of the government. So uh, feel more, but the younger, the younger um, generation are out. And I see that on the consumer behavior of, of, uh, of our customers, because we have five brands, and they all represent a segment uh, of the population. We have the you know, 15 to 25, the 25 to the 30s, and the 40s to the 50s. And the, the sales of those brands are significantly higher on the younger brands than on the older brands, as you see it. So uh, I think this new normal has brought an acceleration to what already existed, which was the more omnichannel, more interactions through online. But people will, we will get accustomed to leave with a face mask. We get accustomed to go out with a face mask. We get accustomed to wash our hands with hydroalcoholic gel, gel every time we go somewhere. So as we get accustomed, it will take a few months, things will ease up. I'm seeing unless, it. I'm unless, there is another, unless there is another, you wave. know, another wave. Right. One of the hottest fashion items apparently for summer of 2020 is the trikini, which is a bikini, but with a face mask. I mean, and luxury brands and matching. I mean, I, I read this great article yesterday and this great luxury brand is actually come out with the trikini. So I think people will adapt. You're absolutely right. I mean, yes. we always do. That's what we always adapt does. to anything. It's our human condition to adapt. We will adapt to this. And we adapt quickly as well, especially when we have a need. Right. And but just, there will be, but there will be, unfortunately, as in all of these things, uh, winners and losers, unfortunately, because there will be businesses that will come to the other side. I think the challenge is how do you get to the other side? And yeah. there, I think financing and unique sort of adaptive partnerships and, and working together really to kind of make sure that you're able to get to the other side becomes important. Let me ask, uh, you know. Can I just continue? Sure, of course. Um, yeah, what, uh, uh, the, the first figures we have from our customers, which are uh, malls uh, in France, is that in fact, uh, on, um, on weeks, uh, not, on, not on Sundays or Saturdays, but on weeks, the revenue of the malls increased by 68% compared to uh, uh, the previous year at the same period. Because in fact, even if the traffic is, uh, is slowing down, people are coming to most to buy. And uh, if we offer them the, the possibility uh, to see uh, what is online, to go uh, in stores, to make like quick shopping, not the whole experience as, uh, as they are used to, uh, as they wanted to do, but uh, at least to, to keep doing their shopping in the stores they like. Uh, they are coming to stores, they are buying, and, and they found the revenue is like high. But let me, let me then ask this panel, right? Uh, I mean, there is staple spending, and then there is discretionary spending. And given what Ramesh described earlier as well, and what we are seeing across the world with major unemployment, I mean, in the US, unemployment numbers have crossed. And, 
And unfortunately, a large part of that unemployment is from the experience economy and the travel and the retail and the FNB, not less retail, but more FNB travel, etc., which accounts for almost 10% of the global economy. And as that doesn't necessarily come back in the same manner anytime soon, there will be large scale unemployment, reduction in incomes, what have you, as businesses get impacted, because after all, it is a domino effect. And so consumption patterns, now talking about financial wherewithal, uh, people might want to spend, they might want to go to a retail mall or might want to buy an iPhone, but will they be postponing that purchase because they have to worry about savings and getting another job or they don't see necessarily how is that going to impact your businesses? And what do you think is, is, uh, is, is as a result, I mean, how does one overcome that? Because you do have consumer demand that while in the short term, because there are a lot of people who probably have no. pent up demand, pent up demand is how does consumer demand come back for non-discretionary spending. So not staples, I'm not talking about food and grocery, I'm talking about discretionary spending. But that, where that, do you see that moving? That's exactly what's going to happen. People, at least for the next year or two years, are going to actually uh, set priority and what is absolutely essential and not something that they want to indulge in totally. So once they put their sanctions together, then they might not, like, for instance, they might not want to buy a car. They could take, take an Uber. Um, the, the, the only difference is that the Uber might not be as well sanitized as your own car. But in, in terms of safety, yes. But in terms of indulgence, people will take, uh, 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 go for whatever is absolutely essential first, other than food. And they're going to be looking to see how the incomes actually uh, resonate with whatever their, 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 their desire to buy might be. So people with spare cash is that different, but people with spare cash will also be very, very frugal with it for the next few years because this is like Murphy's Law. You know, whatever will go wrong, uh, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. This is exactly what is playing out there. And this is what we teach in our, in our college. It's never ever hope for the best. Always prepare for the worst. Now, the fact is that this COVID has caught us completely flat-footed as a planet. Some of it is good, some of it is bad. And most of it is bad for as far as business is concerned. For the planet, taking a rest is it's very good because all the animals are coming out. The sea is cleaner, and water is better, the air is cleaner. Now, are we going to learn from that? Or are we going to go back to exactly the way we were, like Lemmy? So there's a whole shift that is happening in terms of perception. And I think young people today are going to actually take the leadership of that. And if you look at young people today, there are three aspects that when you market to them, because they're going to be the biggest buyers, is that they don't want to get married, they don't want to buy a house, and they don't want to buy a car. So... How do you deal with this? But Prela, to push Can I, I, I mean, given what has happened, wouldn't that behavior perhaps change again, where from buying experiences, they go back to saying, look, this kind of stuff, I do want to own my house. I want my own car. And okay. I will save to do that rather than go spend on something that is transition, you know, is, is momentary. momentary. Okay. Can I? In India, the fact is that you never actually buy your own house. Your parents buy the house for you because they save for you. But the young people today are actually saying that we want to keep our money to travel or to be to experience things and to do things. I don't, we don't want to get stuck with paying EMIs. We don't want to get stuck with paying EMIs for a car or for a house or anything. We want to be absolutely mobile and free. Others? So I think, uh, Can I, make Sid, a comment? Uh, I just want to jump on, uh, yeah. since we are very much in the distributionary space, I just want to jump on. So. See, typically, you know, if you really look at even a uh, year back, uh, when we are talking about, you know, economic uh, slowdown and all that, we were talking about uh, the share of wallet getting split across many uh, distributionary items. Uh, so if you look at it uh, differently, uh, so there is travel, uh, we said that you no know, travel is, for example, if you are in uh, fashion business, 
uh, we always said that uh, the money is getting spent on travel, money is getting spent on entertainment, money is getting spent on eating outside. So now if you really look at it, uh, it's a completely a different uh, space today. Uh, many of those things uh, where the consumer is, was actually spending money, uh, they don't have avenue to actually spend money at least for some more time to come. So that's why, that's why it's very, very important for you to think uh, the whole you know, consumer behavior in three uh, buckets. Uh, there is something which is going to be driven by compulsion and you have to gear yourself. How do we sort of, you know, uh, serve my consumer who is going to be driven by compulsion of social distancing, even if they want to socialize and come in big numbers, they will not be allowed to do that. Uh, we face a challenge at the stores uh, that, you know, even the crowd comes, not more than two people are allowed inside the store. Uh, so how do I engage? For example, we talked about the experience in uh, retail. Retail is all about making consumer to spend a lot of time inside the store. Now we are on a paradigm where we want consumer to spend less time at the store, but still we want to maximize their uh, purchase. It's going to be very important, at least during this uh, compulsion uh, phase, how we are going to engage the consumer at the uh, store. And I see you know, one big opportunity for the physical store it could be a game changer because every physical store has its own set of consumers. If you are able to empower our uh, store staff uh, to really communicate with the consumer base technologically, whether it's social media, we are able to send them the assortment uh, of that store. Uh, we don't have to expose them to the entire assortment, but if we are able to allow them to shop the store, I think these are a few things you know, which we need to do to make sure that during this phase, uh, where survival is going to be very important. I think, you know, definitely social, uh, uh, I mean, everyone will, you know, start uh, socializing very quickly, but uh, they will not be allowed to do it. Uh, so we need to recognize that. And then, I just want to make a point, uh, Sid, yeah, it's okay. Gear up for that. Go ahead, yeah. Rami. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity time, I guess, for everyone to redesign and make affordable products. You know, we are, we are, we are behave, believing that the products will be priced the same way, the cost will be the same, and therefore people can't afford and they may not buy. But I think, at least from the financial services, I can tell you that if we were giving a four-year loan product, we have to make it a seven-year loan product and bring down the EMI for a consumer to be able to offer. The second is, I think in a country like India where leasing is not caught up, I think in this round, you will see leasing becomes one of the most important thing, people may not want to own a car for three years, but if they have a need for six months or one year, I think that will pick up. I think self-drive models will pick up. You know, aggregator model may go through difficulty for some time, but self-drive models where you provide a car and you drive it yourself, and therefore the owner of the car would be someone else and the use will be given to you and therefore you only pay by use. So I think these are the, I would think these are the new emerging opportunities very clearly, we will have to redesign product and services for consumer and broad yeah, base the customer base. I, I think those are, that's absolutely the need of the art. But I think if you push further on that, here's the question that I want to ask this panel, and it might be a little leading or provocative, but it is the big elephant in the room. I mean, India's retail business and associated businesses, consumption businesses are driven by the growth of the middle class. Right? People coming in, increasing incomes, coming into a bracket, a big chunk of people moving into that bracket. That through this destruction of economic activity for external reasons is definitely going to get impacted and pushed out. What does that mean for India's businesses, especially the retail businesses, given this is a retail panel and associated businesses? How do we expect in, in, I mean, of course, in the US, things are more, or in other Western markets or more developed markets, things are more evolved. You're seeing the claim of bankruptcies already sort of increasing. Uh, in India, obviously, not every business is going to make it to the other side as well. I think that's just the reality, unfortunately, of this situation. So two impacts, right? One, the supply side constraints because businesses go out. Hopefully new businesses will get set up and Prehlad's entrepreneurial class will perhaps help them take risk again. But in the short term, right, you're going to see a squeeze on businesses which were not necessarily the most profitable to begin with and were working on working capital cycles which were pretty short. And two, you're going to see a consumer who is as 
many of the panelists, including Ramesh, are saying are going to be, and Prelab, are going to be constrained. So what does that mean for the retail industry as a whole? And I'm can specifically I, talking about the Indian retail industry at this can point. I, can I go first? Yeah, please. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I think if you kind of look at it in the last round, the customer base increased substantially through credit being provided to people and they whether needed a product or not, they bought it because credit was available. I think in this round, very clearly, need base versus aspirational will get identified. And the aspirational ones will stay a little back and need ones will surely buy. Right? I mean, if you go to rural India, the only means of transportation is these kind of vehicles. There are no public transport system. So what do you do? You will have to buy vehicle. People do buy and that's their livelihood. And therefore, these are their livelihood product. And they will make sure that they will therefore buy. You have to make it affordable. Now, what is happening in any industry, at least in our industry, we see, when you kind of aspirational people come to buy, the price of the product and the price of acquisition both goes up and becomes unaffordable for the one who actually needs it. Right? And therefore, they start to suffer. In this round, very clear identification of need base versus aspirational will happen. Product will get redesigned. And maybe we will create a new set of consumers who actually need them. And you will find new set of consumers coming in. Sure. Uh, Ajay, I want to ask you because you specifically, of course, from a redesigning of product and redesigning of the service, did that very successfully at PVR by taking a different format of PVR at a different price point into inner India, if I can call it that, right? And how do you see that? But I want to ask less about your specific business, more about the industry, right? General sector from your perception of where you sit and have sat for so many years. What do you see evolving and happening? Well, uh, Sid, uh, uh, the nine, as I said, the 9,000 scams in the country today and uh, people take the, uh, the price of a very high end cinema like Lower Parel in Phoenix or Juhu, or, or something like that is the average ticket price. The average ticket price in India is still less than 100 rupees, about 80, 70 rupees. And it's still a very big escapism uh, for an average Indian person. He will, so when uh, Ramesh very rightly said aspirational uh, and the, the need-based are two uh, consumptions that are going to happen, and not because it's my business, and I'm self-professing it or anything like that, and trying to paint a rosier picture than, than there is. But I think uh, that very high-end... Uh, uh, like appliances, buying cars, buying homes, uh, expensive stuff or premium things people eliminate because their discretionary spends have come down dramatically. But very low ticket uh, aspirational things which give them pleasure, a quick fix of pleasure, generally speaking, even in recessionary times, don't get impacted. So we've gone through a lot of these cycles in the past. History has gone through lots of cycles in the past. For some reason, there's a correlation between cinema going and recessionary times because you don't get anything for sub 100 rupees where you can quickly get a two and a half hour escapism from the drudgery of your daily lives. So again, I'm saying I'm very focused on my Indian consumer. I'm very focused on this market. This market, I believe that people will still come out. We'll have to do some calibration to our ticket pricing. Our weekend skew and weekday skew has to change because currently our weekend pricing is higher than our week weekday pricing, not just for me, for the whole industry. We'll make sure even for social distancing reasons, I think I don't want the entire, uh, you know, people to go on the weekend. You spread it out because Monday to Thursday is weekdays. So we'll have to do some, uh, another word that uh, uh, a product, affordable product pricing will have to be done to make sure that it gets spread out evenly. But I, I believe that if new movies are there and uh, given the Indian appetite and pent up demand to go out at a low ticket price, people will go out and, uh, and consume. Even truncated menu of the FNB. FNB is going to be very truncated now. Only those need movie-based, what we call hero items, sorry for my uh, parlance that I'm using, are going to be there. Popcorn, Pepsi, nacho, sandwiches, that's it. Nothing too fancy, nothing too elaborate. Manish, from where you sit, you are seeing stuff across Asia Pacific. Uh, and certain countries have obviously opened before others are, including India, is, you know, in, in sort of just about getting out of lockdown, whereas other countries in the region have now you know, experienced this uh, previously and have opened up and there is say 30 to 45 days, which is not a lot, but 30 to 45 days of sort of a head start in terms of what patterns are emerging. 
And if we could extrapolate some of those patterns, and as Europe opens up now, or uh, different countries in Europe open up, if we could extrapolate those patterns to, to, to India, what would you think are the lessons? And Suresh, maybe you're hearing this from your brands as well, because your brands are international brands, many of them, and perhaps they are seeing. So once we, we get Manisha's views, I would love to, for you to chime in as well on this. Sure. Uh, Sure. So Sid, uh, I guess, you know, the, the one that we have the most proof points from or data from right now is really China. You know, there are other markets as well, uh, but I, I think, you know, the real, the real one that we have is China. And it's interesting, you know, hearing from the panel on, on you know, where the discretionary spend will go and consumer behavior and all of that. Uh, and I was just looking at some stats before I rolled into this, uh, you know, panel discussion. Uh, the, the, one, the one area that's doing really well in China at the moment is actually luxury brands. You know, so uh, we've got some data where, you know, uh, what we're getting back from the luxury brands is that, you know, 90% of, you know, what they did, uh, sorry, they've got 90% of sales at this point in the year versus last year, uh, which, is, which is incredible, given that, you know, they were all shut down for four or six weeks, uh, you know, at some point earlier in the year. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's also fair to say that, you know, uh, why we, we try and extrapolate from, uh, from China, I think there's one crucial difference, uh, you know, Sid, which is, uh, which is underappreciated, is the China, Chinese consumer who is unable to travel right now. So, you know, the Chinese consumer who was traveling to different parts of Europe and the US and uh, other, other destinations and spending their money there are now all spending their money you know, uh, in the country. So I think that's, that's a big sort of factor which uh, perhaps won't play out for India in the same way. The other indicator which actually surprised many of us was that some of the theme parks that opened, even though there were restrictions on the number of people that could go back to them, so, you know, they weren't opening 100%, uh, you know, even with the rest restricted numbers of, I think it was about 50 or 60% that they were allowing in, in the first round, the tickets were sold off in a matter of minutes. Uh, you know, so to go back to Ajay's point earlier, you know, people wanted to get back to having, you know, um, a small ticket size, bite size, uh, you know, uh, by a uh, chunk of entertainment. Uh, uh, the, the other big change, of course, is uh, that, you know, the, the malls are all sort of uh, equipping themselves uh, in, in terms of how they let people in. And I think that's something that for owners uh, and, and investors uh, in India, uh, I, I think there are various lessons, and I won't get get into that in this uh, in this discussion right now. But happy to take that offline with anyone interested uh, on how they're letting people in slowly uh, and ensuring um, that there is uh, some sort of traffic to the malls. What's interesting, and I heard someone perhaps mention this earlier, is uh, that <clears throat> another lesson from China is that the number of people coming in is obviously lower, but the, the shopper or the or the, the the retail consumer at the moment is more purposeful. When he comes into the shop, he might spend only 10 minutes, but he knows what he wants, he buys it and he leaves. So it, it's interesting that the conversion numbers are higher even though the footfalls are lower. Uh, with that, I'll stop again in the interest of ensuring that everyone gets a voice. So I'll Sorry. just add to what, uh, yeah, I will just add to what uh, Manish said. I think, you know, we actually you know, don't have too much of uh, uh, data other than China. And that's what all the international partners are uh, also telling. But I think the one big difference between uh, India lockdown and lockdown in the rest of the world is the uh, rest of the world, you know, e-commerce continued uh, during lockdown. Uh, whereas in India, we didn't have e-commerce during uh, lockdown. So in a way, uh, I would say that, you know, uh, e-commerce, you know, kept the retail uh, ticking uh, internationally. And then uh, what really happened was as the lockdown, you know, the period of lockdown got extended, e-commerce sales actually went up uh, pretty sharply internationally. So one big trend is uh, you really you know focus on uh, e-commerce, and then you have a huge opportunity. I mean, even the companies which are not focusing on e-commerce, I think, will have to really you know uh, work hard in terms of you know uh, increasing their appeal in the e-commerce. So that I think is a one big uh, trend, and I'm sure that you know it's going to happen uh, in India as well because we are now seeing that happening because initially when we e-commerce opens up, it opens up with 30 to 40 percent of their normal demand and quickly ramps up to 100% of their normal uh, demand. When I say quickly ramps up, it happens within a couple of uh, weeks' time. Uh, that's the kind of trend we are seeing in uh, India. And uh, three things, you know, from the retail uh, point of view, very specific. I think conversions are far higher because uh, 
it's a need based uh, buy people are coming with the intention of buying something uh, they're buying and also the the basket sizes are going up and that again is a trend which uh, i think there are these three trends you know which i am now mentioning are very common between international market and what we are now seeing in the very short time uh, we are open good conversion good basket size Bas basket size is going up as i as 25% uh, compared to what it was uh, before and the third very interesting thing is a fairly a large uh, increase in uh, kids wear clothing uh, so these are i would say three quick trends uh, which some of our international partners were mentioning to us uh, which uh, we are seeing that happening in india as well right yeah. so we are going to take the next 15 minutes and jump into questions from the audience there are over 750 people at at peak uh, about 700 people on going and people have been pinging me with questions so i'll pick a few and i'll address them to specific people or just generally to the panel so the first one is just generally to the panel and it's one of the most uh, most sort of uh, the big elephant in the room as uh, as lots of people are saying both for landlords and for people who occupy real estate so i'll go straight in uh, this is a question from hari kan kanala i hope i pronounced the name correctly and this is to all panelists are you able to get any rental exceptions during lockdown in retail and cinemas as well and how are you managing your rental burdens and i will take my uh, my job as the moderator to add a subtext to it if you are a landlord how are you managing it as well well i can tell you what we do as a as a tenant maybe we can let somebody as a landlord uh for us is very clear that while we are locked down and we have zero revenue we don't get to enjoy the premises that we signed a lease for so we don't feel that we should pay for the time that we are locked down primarily because we don't get to enjoy the premises for a major cause for the reasons that we all know but that's the reality and my ability to generate revenue in order to pay is zero so that is for us the 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 basic premises and because we are a multinational and we are in more than 54 countries we have different ways of looking at it in different countries in some countries the legislation uh, you know give you a extremes in poland the government came out with a law that you don't pay while you're closed so there's nothing to discuss with the landlord <coughs> france is a little more difficult there is a mediator right now that you know needs to mediate between the landlords and um, the tenants to find an agreement um but for us that is the basic premises but there is a second part of this conversation which is since revenue is not going to be at the same level that it was back a year ago or back in february shall we continue to pay the same price we paid before if we're going to do 50% of our sales no. or whatever that is so that's a conversation to be had because we don't know how much we're going to do you know we're opening up right now and we don't know what it's going to be yeah. reality is going to hit and if landlords in system continuing with their regular conditions and sales are 50% lower retailers will close they will so simply let me close that one step further uh, jose uh, what if the landlord has a bank loan on the property and needs to pay interest should they go to the bank and say look we're not going to pay you because our retailers are not paying us or do they pay out of their own pockets no i think they should i think this is a conversation to involve many actors including the government including the retailers including the landlord and everybody everybody there governments are at least in europe and in the us as well yeah, i'm asking this specific I, i i i understand that and certain countries are doing it and certain countries are not doing it but my limited question was if you as a retailer take the view that i'm just not going to do it because i wasn't there or i couldn't access it what do you expect your landlord to do to hand over the keys to the bank can i uh, answer no. what we have done as a banker yes sure so, yeah. yeah so what we have done is uh, to some of the properties that we are on rent we have asked for a exemption of rent but we are given them advance for few future months through which he can service his emi and we have left it to him to negotiate with the banker for a reduced interest or whatever so we have protected his cash flow from the point of view of ability to repay but we have requested for exemption so somewhere he said instead of two months one month exemption somewhere they have said we'll overall Actually, reduce the rent for a year and uh, not for the two months so there are different patterns that have emerged 
Sid, I will uh, jump into that because we have been in a very active conversation with uh, all the developers. I think, you know, more uh, both the sides, uh, we need to look at it more from the long term uh, point of view uh, because there is definitely zero revenue for two, these two months or three months. And also revenue is going to be much lower as we go forward. Yeah. How we are going to sort of spread the pain on both the sides across 12 months and 15 months and 18 months is I think is something which uh, we have to work towards. Rather than looking at, you know, uh, everyone taking, you know, all the pain within three months or uh, one, one party taking all the pain in three months, the other party, you know, getting away without any pain, you know, uh, for those three months should not be the approach. So the way uh, I would like to look at it, that the way we are looking at it is how do we sort of spread it so that over a period of 18 months, uh, the pain is equally shared. And then when things come back, uh, no, nobody is really impacted uh, too much. Uh, so that's the approach I think. Uh, uh, one should take uh, in the current uh, situation. I agree 100%. People, we need to, to look at this. Uh, we're all in this together. This is not a one side or, an, or, a, or another side. We're all in this together. Governments have to take a responsibility to help the way they help everyone else, including the malls in there. We have to take our responsibility and the landlords have to take the responsibility as well to share the burden of what it is, but insisting on that you need to pay for the months that you were closed when you have zero revenue, even from the legality point of view, I don't think that's correct, but we're all in this together. And the, the way out of this is by communication and by really negotiating and everybody taking a hit because we are in this together. So, so let me, let me, this is, is yeah. that the landlord is just as much an entrepreneur as any other entrepreneur because he is investing in a business that, that, that rent is his business. Okay. So why should his risk be put on to the, uh, to the uh, renting? He should take the, he should be able to, as an entrepreneur, if everybody is taking a hit, he should be ready to take that hit. Because if he's not, if he thinks he has a fixed asset and it's made in concrete and the law is written in, 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 uh, in stone, uh, he's got another thing coming because there's going to be, because of the evacuation of, of people from cities, and a lot of people are leaving cities today, there's going to be more housing than there's rental. And if they do not create a brand for themselves, which is compassionate and which is, which is a strong brand. Now, this I'm talking for all industries. In so, these times of hardship, the strongest brands will survive the best because people Mena, will... the question is you need to survive to be strong as well. So exactly. I think it's a cyclical reference, right? I mean, you need to survive to be strong. And if right. you are, if you go out of business, you can be compassionate all you want, but so, you but, know, but it is what it is. Landlord, as yes. a landlord, your asset is not going anywhere. The only thing that's going away is your earning. And that is a part of your risk. Yeah. So I think I, I think the question was based on the presumption that most real estate landlords, whether it be a high street landlord or it be a shopping center or a retail village, would have substantial amount of debt. And that debt needs to be serviced. And they would have operating costs because if every retailer or occupant decided to not pay, their revenue also goes to zero. Right? They're, that is their revenue. They don't have any other source of revenue. Okay. So goes to zero and all the costs remain, then what do they do? So I think what I'm hearing from everybody, which is basically what practically is the solution, everybody needs to share the pain and you need to come up with creative solutions. Correct. And I think relationships will matter here. Creative solutions will matter here. I think what will matter is people not just kind of taking rigid viewpoints, but perhaps kind of being a little more amenable and practical to say everybody is suffering. After all, the banks are in the business of lending also, right? They need to get interest to be able to survive themselves. So I think everybody needs to kind of sort of come together in this, which is really what most informed and hopefully most people will do or are doing. Um, another question which I find very interesting, and I think it was alluded to uh, previously, what does the new trial room look like, right? If there, are there going to be trial rooms at all? Or are we going to have like for a lot of retailers, right? I mean, how is this going to work? Because if somebody comes and touches or tries on clothes, do those clothes have to be removed? 
I think Suresh, you touched upon this earlier and I was reading this very interesting article or for online apparel as well. And I think one of the metrics or numbers I was being told was that while people are buying a lot of stuff online, the returns are 40%. 40% of everything that is bought in the non sort of food and grocery item list is actually being returned. So that's also quite interesting to see. And then what do you do with those returns? Do they go through an entire cleansing process? And how does that work? Because if people are not being allowed to try on and people are saying like, I'll send you 10 different things as some of our panelists alluded to at home for you to try on, frankly, how, how does that, I mean, that's, how does how does that process work? What does that do for logistics? What does that do for cost of fulfillment? What does that do for a simple trial room that we all took for granted? What happens now? How does that even operate? Uh, Sid, I will uh, get in because it uh, directly affects our business. Uh, we have actually suspended uh, trials inside the store. So in a way, you know, our trial rooms are uh, shut. Uh, we are giving the option to the consumers to take it home, uh, try it out and no question, ask to return within three days. And then, of course, we have put a protocol on what do we do with the return, you know, in terms of steaming or uh, there's a certain protocol so that the safety and hygiene standards are uh, you know, uh, maintained. Uh, so that is, I'm talking about uh, what we are doing as of now. But uh, I think, you know, very soon some technological uh, solutions will come. Uh, I think uh, there are already I'm seeing some uh, four or five proposals from uh, startups on body measurement because we al always had a ma uh, magic mirror which had, you know, you can try out multiple options, but uh, there is nothing for the body measurement. Uh, so I think, you know, now uh, there are a few options which are coming up and if something comes up, then that could be a good uh, alternative. But uh, there is no solution, uh, at least for time being. Uh, than to allow the consumers to take it home, try it out, and then return if they it doesn't fit uh, fit them. One last question, given the interest of time, but this affects a lot of the people who are listening into this webinar and all of our companies and uh, the people that we work with. What advice would you give to people who are working in the industry or are looking to join the industry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, I, can I just say something, just to summarize what everyone has said, I think that something which is very important is that, in fact, uh, customers' behaviors have changed from for years, as we see with uh, Jeff Bezos uh, becoming the first uh, trillionaire in, uh, in the world. So it means that uh, online is something very important, but the way we use online is also very important because... <clears throat> Um, online uh, should be used to increase customers experience and also uh, the, the idea of reconciling the online and the physical is very important because it increased the overall profitability. For instance, we were talking about uh, uh, exchange and the exchange rates online, it's true, but if uh, you give the customers the, the, the opportunity to come and to exchange in-store, you 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 generate you a, a new touch point with your customers and you have you, you do not have to pay for returns so uh, it's also something that's a increased customers experience but also reinforce the relationship you can create with your customers and for I'm, luxury I'm sorry to cut you off but given that we are running out of time i do still want yeah. to address my question which is basically should everybody in retail be looking to move to the logistics industry or should, should they still work in retail uh Sid, i will uh, take that question uh, see i think you know uh, what is going to be really important uh, in retail is going to be uh, the retail uh, I think there is no question that uh, everyone has to look at the manning norms inside a store. Uh, for example, we had four people uh, in a thousand square feet store. We probably will have to look at three, not for immediate uh, requirement, but even from the future uh, point of view. What we are really looking at and encouraging our own people is to let you become a little, become, a little bit become you know, technologically uh, savvy. Uh, the, their ability to communicate with the customer uh, through social media tools their ability to uh, get the payment done uh, touchless. So there are, no, they have to build certain digital skills, which we will facilitate uh, them to build uh, so that, you know, uh, they become a value added uh, salesperson at the store. 
and i think that is going to be very important so it's going to be probably a slightly better salary but lesser number of people uh, that's right. going to be the norm if you i can know. just take the opportunity sorry we're just out of time i'm being told we have to wrap up so i want to take the opportunity to thank all the panelists thank you for your insights for your time for sharing your thoughts i want to leave with uh, leave the audience and the panel with some parting thoughts which is basically as the animal kingdom of which humans are part of human reaction or animal reaction is typically could fall into one of three buckets fight flight or freeze right that's typically what you see so either you stand and fight or flight you run away or you freeze and that is also a natural sort of tendency for certain types of animals that they freeze as self defense right but i think the great companies the great entrepreneurs and uh, great solutions or great inventiveness will come from probably kind of thinking about each of these businesses in some cases flight you just have to change the model of the business because the business yeah. may become irrelevant and technology does that from time to time and has in the past could be fight readapt retool turn around find new ways of doing business adapt innovate uh, all the rest of it that comes along with it uh, or freeze and you know in certain cases it has been observed do nothing might be a strategy itself so i'm not sure that's, if that's the best that, way to go right it. now but <laughs> Not in this case. You, you not in this case. But as wrapping up, I leave you with that: fight, flight, or freeze. But I think, irrespective of which one you choose out of those three, I think we have to have a sense of acceptance that this is real. And I think if we accept it and move beyond that, saying that this is not just going to go away, and we learn to live with the new normal, I think, as others have said. we will all find creative solutions to address the new markets and new customers that hopefully all of us will have thank god with that thank you very much everybody i thoroughly enjoyed this i hope you did and to all our participants uh, i hope you found this useful thank you very much to mapic as well thank you guys thank you very much thank you yeah thank, thank you. you thank you so much mr sidhu uh, you know for leading the session and thank you very much panelist i think your experience which you have shared would really be helpful for our listeners and thank you all listeners and we really appreciate you being here uh, or uh, if you have any questions uh, do us know write to us and we will be able to help you uh, this is for the attendees